A very warm welcome to all who are joining us today. Thank you very much for taking time out of what I suspect are increasingly uh, busy schedules. You're joining this webinar and I thought I'd say a little bit about it before we get started. So my name is Linda Amran Cooper and I'm head of the Centre for Distance Education at the University of London and chair for this afternoon. For over 15 years, the centre has undertaken applied research evaluation and fostered innovation with distance online and flexible blended learning. So while the pandemic has had very many real downsides, for the work for the Centre for Distance Education, we have seen a flourishing in our world of distance and online education. Innovation, exploration and a commitment to improvement are themes we have observed. During the summer, Goldsmith University of London and the University of London in Paris started working with the Centre for Distance Education to explore the way digital and online education is changing, changed really rapidly in 2020. We conceived of this webinar series, Experiences in Digital Learning, the idea with the series of webinars is to hear from stakeholders who are involved in the grand adventure of digital learning in the time of pandemic. <coughs> Excuse me. Colleagues may be aware of a report that's just launched from JISC, sorry. Um, <coughs> following their recent work, <coughs> sorry, entitled Learning and Teaching Reimagined. I'll pop a link into the chat, but I thought I would share <clears throat> three of their main findings, finding from some <coughs> key stakeholder groups. Here is what they found. Students prefer blended learning that incorporates extensive online components alongside in-person learning because it's more convenient, saves time and makes it easier to access course materials. Lecturers see opportunities to improve educational outcomes by adopting a wide range of learning activities, allowing greater flexibility of study times, space for reflection and a move to different forms of assessment. And leaders in higher education believe blended learning enables anytime, anywhere learning, breaks down geographical barriers to delivery and extends institutional reach into new markets. As we travel through the rest of this academic year, the experiences in digital learning webinar series will help us to probe these findings, to explore the ways in which we are developing, to align with and exceed the expectation of stakeholders in higher education. Turning to today's event, I'm delighted to introduce our expert panel who will share with you some of their innovations at, in, and excellence in relation specifically to synchronous teaching. Learning that happens right now with our students while they're in the same time frame, but not necessarily the same geogra geographical space as their teachers. This is an exciting area of rapid and effective development. And so we couldn't resist entitling today's webinar as Adventures in Synchronous Online Teaching. Slides please with the presenters, Andrew, if you can. We have three presentations of 10 minutes each. So first of all, we've got Mark and Matt from uh, Goldsmith University. And after them, we have Simon from SOAS. And then finally, Thierry from Paris. So it's fantastic to have an international panel here. And I know that we've got an international audience. So three presentations, about 10 minutes each, and we should have 10 minutes uh, discussion time between each and then a bit at the end. And I may invite the panel to comment on each other's input too at the end. In terms of audience interaction, it's a live a Teams live streamed event, so you're not able to put your camera or your um, sound on, but you can input questions. And my colleague is just showing you how the uh, questions 
appear on the screen. So we'll be monitoring the questions and it's my job to try and uh, make sure that the uh, presenters get the opportunity to address some of the questions. So that's the Q&A tab there. So what I'll do now is hand over to our first speakers, Mark and Matt from Goldsmiths University of London to share with us their adventures. Hello, my name is Mark Dinverno. Uh, and together with my uh, long-term colleague, Matthew E. King, both of us from Goldsmiths, University of London, we're going to talk about the ideas of presence and performance, two carefully chosen words there, uh, as part of um, uh, a series um, that's hosted again by University of London and Goldsmiths uh, on uh, our experiences of um, teaching online. And this particular session was called Adventures in Online Synchronous Learning. And just to be clear, we are re-recording this talk for two reasons. One, we want to give a high quality um, uh, resolution download available for anyone who's interested. And second, there were things that we learned from giving the talk and getting the feedback from the delegates there. And we're including some of those ideas as well in this, but it's essentially, it's the same talk. Uh, Matthew and I have been heavily involved in setting up um, the BSc in Computer Science. It's a partnership between the University of London, between Goldsmiths and between Coursera, which is kind of the major online uh, learning platform in the world. And um, uh, it's fair to say that we have learned a, a huge amount in doing this. Uh, and, you know, we didn't go looking for feedback from students, but the students really kind of something, something worked. I mean, we, we worked really hard on this. We tried, some things didn't work, some things did work, but we got very, very uh, fantastic feedback from some of the students um, and maybe there's things here that you know that are interesting and so we kind of wanted to share what we're doing in the spirit again of, of seeing what other people are out there doing and maybe we can develop a, a stronger sense about how to make these lectures less about lots of material and more about the kind of experience of learning together and that's really key so I wouldn't um, typically do this so so uh, here is a slide and I want to say why bullet points are difficult. I think part of what makes uh, something really exciting and engaging is it's improvised. You see the kind of creative processes of me as, I, as they unfold as I'm teaching about the subject. We'll come to that in a minute. I think bullet points, it's too preordained. It's very hard to connect with them in an exciting and curious and oh gosh, uh, way um, that you can do with the unfolding moment to moment of a creative practice like doing maths, like playing the piano uh, uh, and like um, programming. And we'll come to programming a bit later. So I wouldn't use slides. And if I had some things to say to students, I would absolutely just use a, a camera like this without any text and say, you know, one of the things that I'm really keen to talk about is we're kind of scared about being stuck uh, and actually, I think stuck being stuck is the most wonderful thing because it's only then as you kind of, you know, uh, the ecstasy of kind of, you know, not being able to do something and you're really trying with all of your, your mind and your heart to work something out. It's only then really that the big learning takes place and the joy of going from stuck to working things out. You know, if we got everything first time round, where would be the fun in learning? So, you know, what, there are some important points I want to say. I will come up front and say them. So the first thing I want to talk about is presence and in presence is my physical environment. I can make my digital presence much stronger if I care about the digital environment. So some obvious mistakes here. I would not normally talk by an open window. But I'm going to close that and immediately I hope that you see that my um, uh, I, I come a bit more alive. But I do a bit more than that. This is up to you. This is a very cheap black screen which I put behind me. So I will do that. It's not completely perfect, but I could adjust that in real time so that you don't notice uh, these uh, little corners. I can do that. So that's one thing that I can do. Another thing I can do is some cheap lights here that I've got. I can give myself a bit of light and giving all of my secrets away. What I have tended to do, and again, it's about, you know, we talk about um, uh, presence and performance. It's, 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 it's trying to give myself as much presence as possible so I can create a performance so that the students are engaged. You know, we're reading so much about students turning off online I mean, you know it is this is really hard to try and do this anyway i'm giving away all my secrets i hope you don't mind me doing this but now now, now so i've got black back cloth this is how i tend to do it i've got some lights here which like you know i can i can you know move around and i can use my hands and my face to really communicate things so having done my physical presence the next thing i think i want to talk to you about is sound 
Um, at the moment, I am using, I have to say, it's a very nice uh, microphone, but uh, um, you can get USB microphones uh, reasonably cheap and it is worth uh, investigating sound. I'm going to just show you the difference. I'm using this mic at the moment, but listen what happens if I go back to the microphone on my laptop machine, uh, on my desktop machine. This is what it sounds like on my desktop machine. And you might be able to, I, I don't know what you're hearing because I'm not quite sure what's recording, but you might hear more buzz. It, the sound might not be so good. And I'm going to switch back to my Rode USB in one, two, switch. and I hope that you find, and sound is really important. Sound is really important because you want people to hear the nuances of what you're saying. If it's curiosity, if it's joy, if it's uh, surprise, if um, you know a student said something and you you're talking you're using their name and you're trying to connect with them on what they're saying so good sound is probably the single most important thing I think when giving uh, an online lecture so I've got my physical environment I have got my um, uh, uh, my um, sound going okay and so the next thing I introduce is the idea of an, an, another camera so I use the second camera quite a bit and I like to use a second camera because it means that I can look at various places and I'll come back to that in a minute. But it, it does give a sense of dynamism between uh, when you're cutting. So, I mean, I can notice now that again, I have to go in and say, so, I mean, I, you know, I'm doing this without having done. So I need to cut that without cutting me and then I can go back into frame. So I can talk to you and still do the same things. I st uh, but I love the idea of being able to cut between uh, this this camera and that camera it gives a sense of dynamism now what I'm using in order to do this is something called OBS and if I put both cameras on um, it will mean that uh, I'm not I sometimes get lost about which camera I'm looking at and I can see that I haven't quite got this right that the, uh, um, there you are you can see all of me so you know you need to do a lot of preparation I mean this takes a lot of practice it's not a natural thing for me to be pressing these buttons and teaching you know, I would walk into a classroom and just go to the whiteboard and talk and, and, and get some energy going in the classroom. So I've tried, you know, I've worked really hard. I've taken some time to do this and a lot of mistakes made in trying to get to this point. And there, I can still see mistakes happening now. But I'm giving you a sense of, of how I create a, a sense of performance online. So in some sense, I'm ready to go. I've got my costume. I've got my background it's kind of like a black box theater if you know what that is like the almeida in, in islington in london uh, i've got lights uh, i've got microphones i've got sound I, i'm you know uh, almost i could have music uh, but uh, i don't have music so now i now we go into what happens when we actually give the lecture so it's broadcast on zoom we make sure that we record both the zoom and the original obs broadcast i should note that i'm using some an open source software called open broadcast software which is free and open source and it's a fantastically flexible and brilliant system that you can use at home to create a mini recording studio like this uh, and we can talk about that another time and so the question is how do I create a sense of theater now that I have my presence now that I have my scenes set up in this system OBS uh, and what I found to use is the whiteboard because it captures my ongoing kind of moment to moment um, interaction with the maths that I'm speaking about uh, and so so what happens is on the zoom students either give their name or they're logged on anonymously and I work with Matthew and other colleagues at Goldsmiths and they're telling me what's going on so that um, they will happily interrupt they've got a great question here because I, tr I try really hard to look at the questions and stop and read the questions but you can't help but get carried away sometimes. So having other people there just to make sure that you are really engaging with the students and what their questions are is really important. So again, this is hard to do on my own and I've relied hugely on Matthew and colleagues to help me with this. Um, there are some other things to say. I put my name there um, because I want students to feel they can address me as Mark or Professor Dinverno. Uh, and I try really hard to make sure that if they give me their name, I thank them for their questions and that they, they feel part of the story. You know, this idea of connection is really tough online. So if they, they are willing to give of themselves and ask a question, really respect that. And what I haven't been doing now is what I'm teaching is to try to give space. The best advice I ever got when about, um, you know, speaking is to try to make it a conversation, even if it's imagined. Okay, I'm laboring the point here, 
but that that's what I try to do so in performance um you know I'm teaching mathematics and I'll talk about you know the differential of something and if someone says what's the differential of 4x cubed I will talk about it like this now one thing I haven't done is I haven't really been speaking to the right camera so let me do that now and so so I'm now speaking to the right camera so dy d so y equals 4x cubed see this is so it's so difficult to remember all of these things dy dx but I don't want to take loads of takes of this I want you to feel that this is improvised as well dy dx is is 12x squared and I can talk about the mechanism so there's something about it being improvised there's something about it being connected there's something about it being shared there's something about students having agency as we learn together and there is a theater there is we, we are creating this performance in 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 real time and and you know and there's a humility I mean I have made lots of mistakes doing this not just looking at the wrong camera but um, making mistakes in my method or or the calculation itself and students don't mind that because they can see that you're trying and you've got all this technology and they can see you're putting yourself out of your comfort zone and there is something exciting about that I think you know if teaching is, is too you know with the slideshow and with the bullet points and it's like and here is the next point I want to make it's too safe there is something about you bringing all of yourself into the teaching that moment to moment creative process and so you know things to think about try and make it improvised try and make it feel like your creative processes are really unfolding in the moment as you're teaching so those are just some reflections you know, there's lots more to say and um but what i want to do now is, is hand over to my colleague matthew yi king who is in a in a studio in goldsmith somewhere okay so thank you very much for now Yeah, so uh, thank, thanks, Mark. Uh, that's a really brilliant demo. And I'd just like to say that it's really the students responded very well to Mark's video there. And, and they, they said things like, you know, it's great to see a master at work. We felt really privileged to be able to, you know, have, have this learning experience. So definitely, you know, all those little pieces fitted together to, to give a really uh, impressive result that students really engaged with. And there were loads of questions, lots of interaction that went on in the sessions as well. Uh, I should also say, though, that often when you see someone doing quite virtuosic stuff like you just saw with Mark, uh, that it's easy to imagine that they can just pop out and, and just do that straight off the bat. But actually, I'm sure Mark would agree here uh, that this this uh, this setup was reached through a process of of iteration. You know, we we uh, we worked together and, and had other colleagues as well uh, looking at the video that Mark was making, and we'd look at the lighting and we'd say, well, maybe you need a bit more light, or maybe you know the background's a bit too bright. And we did iterate on that. We moved the camera around to different positions. We got a slightly improved camera at one point as well, and you know, it, eventually all the pieces came together into the result that Mark just demonstrated there. So really, you know, to give people confidence that's very much the kind of the approach you're going to need to take to get good at this and to be a reflective practitioner and be prepared to look at your own teaching style and see what you can improve and, and what, what's wrong with it and, and to learn to identify those elements so working with other people and getting them to look at your your output is, is a really good idea so what I wanted to do is just show some of the similar kind of concepts but what happens if you try and do them in a more professional studio so where i am right now is our uh, new one person operable uh, video studio so which was originally developed for the purposes of recording videos for online learning as opposed to live but actually uh, as you can see here you know it's really excellent for doing live and it's it's very much designed around the idea that someone can do a quite improvisatory natural looking lecture and they can really control it so before i demonstrate the sort of technical aspects of it i just wanted to pull up my camera here and show you uh what we what we can do uh, or what the studio looks like rather so let me just pull up the camera and then you can see, so yeah, so we've got these uh, large softbox lights up there. We've got a green screen painted on the wall there. We've got special paint. And we have these two strip lights to light the green screen. And then we've got the camera and monitor over there so I can see what I'm doing. And I can see the camera there. And then we've got the machine for capturing and the various inputs there and my messy stuff. So that's the studio. And what I, I wanted to show you is what it can do. So the idea is that, we can switch between different inputs. So you can see at the moment, 
I'm kind of, uh, you can see I've got an iPad input feeding into it and I can control my camera angle. So I might begin my presentation by saying, you know, hello, uh, welcome to Goldsmiths. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, how to use different camera angles to emphasize what you're saying. And then at some point you might want to drop into the corner of the screen and then switch to another input and then maybe say, okay, so what we're going to be talking about is this highly technical looking drawing. And you can see here, I've got a really important block of gray and white blobs, which have a very important meaning, right? And then you might at some point want to emphasize what you're saying. So you can jump into the middle of the screen and say, yes, I'm talking to you. Uh, and I'm trying to tell you about those in gray blocks, which you just saw. And then at some point, maybe you want to just get out of the way and then allow the student to just see what's on your screen and, and take that in. And you know, these techniques very much came from uh, our, my teaching technique as well as Mark's, which is this improvisational thing. And I do a lot of teaching of programming. And so what you can see here is, is uh, a live coding environment that I might use. And so I can, I can do my demo by going in and coding. And, and this is web-based, so even students can actually go and see this. So, so they, can, they can be given the link to this, this page you can see here, and they can go and look at that page and they can watch the code being edited, or they can just watch my version of it. So I guess in terms of accessibility, that gives them the ability to you know, zoom in the code, go to uh, high visibility mode, and so on, and, and just set it up how they want. And they can watch the code at the same time. But that's a kind of another thing. But anyway, let's just see what this program does. Uh, so you can see it plays some music. Uh, and yeah, so the idea is really that you can, you can do all kinds of stuff and the main thing being that you can improvise your, your talk, emphasize what you're saying by changing the camera angles, change your inputs between different things, and even uh, end up with a nice neat background at the end and jump around on the screen as you want. And it all works very nicely. Or you can just simply, if you're recording, just capture the raw camera input to go back to the beginning again. And there's my green screen behind me. You can see that's viewed straight through the camera there. So I don't know if Mark, I want to hand back over to Mark, see if he's got any comments about this as well. Thank you, Matthew. Um, uh, not only am I looking at the right camera, you'll notice that I've uh, slightly shrunk uh, the OBS uh, window so that you don't see the corners of my black uh, background. Um, uh, wise words, um, as always, Matt, and, and, and thank you for your kind <laughs> words at the beginning there. Uh, we, we, so we're putting this out there. Please contact us if you're interested in sharing your experiences. Um, you know, we're really interested. How do we make this work? Uh, m my feeling for what it's worth is that we will move from very heavily content-rich programs to this much more idea of experiential learning of working through something together and so building platforms and bl building ways in which we can learn together and get a sense of a shared journey i think will be the future of online learning so thanks very much for listening and do contact matthew and me um, if you'd like to share some of your ideas great thanks There are some technical questions in, in the discussion panel about sort of the equipment that you're using. Um, and I think that it, it might be useful. Mark, were you, did you have a camera po uh, pointed to um, a, a white piece of paper that you were writing on? Or was that a special whiteboard or something? Uh, um, so let me, so let me, it's, it's more difficult now because I haven't got the screen, but basically I'm showing you myself. I've got a white pad here. And above the white hat pad is the camera, uh, the USB camera, it's, I, oh, which, which I might have just broken for the sake of education here. Hold on one second. This is live, folks. This is, this is live television. We're not Anyone holding back. <laughs> anyway, so it's, it's an affordable USB camera, which may or may not now work. I don't know. Uh, the light is still on. These are pretty robust. I've got a stand, which is 15 pounds. I've got a white pad. Um, and, and other things are falling on the floor. But that sense of liveness is what this is all about. And I've got a USB microphone. Um, so yes, of course the kit wasn't, you know, and I've got a light and a light stand. So yes, the equipment is there, but the, you, could, you, you, know, you, could, you can do this, I reckon, for less than a thousand pounds, set yourself up to teach from home. Yeah. Okay. 
I, I mean, for some colleagues, the question will be where that thousand pounds comes I, from. I know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, yeah. And uh, so some of the questions in the uh, in the panel were, were quite sort of technical. So Mark and Matt, if you get a chance to respond to the technical questions, uh, kind of as we're going through the event, that would be really uh, useful. One of the a couple of the questions that um, sort of popped out in, from from reviewing the questions was um, really the question of accessibility um, and uh, you know for example how what do students have in terms of access to the to this session afterwards and perhaps in advance so that they can prepare so so would you mind addressing either of you or both of you that accessibility type question yes so so one of the things that you always have to remember as a native english speaker is not is try to and you and you have to say right at the beginning and I, I knew I only had nine minutes or something, Linda. If I'm speaking too quickly, you, you please tell me in the chat. And moreover, we record everything. So we record my session on OBS, we record the Zoom session, and we make those available online, every single thing that I do, so that it's always there for students to come back to for as long as they want. So even though the synchronous, real-time improvised moments are, are really important, the students have absolute agency on where they want me to go, whether they want me to pull back, lean in. And, you know, they, I, I'd like to think that by the end of the course, we trusted each other to, to make sure that students did not feel excluded um, in the moment. That's that's what's really key. Inclusion is a really important um, aspect, but we I, I want these sessions that every student feels included in the synchronous moment and I think knowing that it's going to be recorded and online it does help give a sense of safety that they can go back to it it's yeah. not the only answer to, to the inclusion issue but it's something that obviously we, we thought extremely hard about Linda yeah no that's really helpful I think that's right and, and a couple of colleagues as, it, as we've gone through here have talked about captioning software as well which ensures that there's a kind of a, a, a record of that discussion Absolutely. Um, and, and I think you picked up on one of the questions which was about interactivity and how you draw you know how the students get it involved in that um, so I think that's brilliant. Matt, was there anything you wanted to add in terms of some of the questions that were coming up around equipment? I mean, people are talking about OBS Studio. So is that what this is, what you're using? Uh, so Mark, Mark's using OBS Studio. Uh, I'm using um, a thing called an ATEM Mini, which is a little £250 box, which you can plug thing cameras into uh, but I also have I've written some custom software which you can get for free on my github uh, which allows you to control it uh, run more sophisticated uh, controls on it. it essentially turns it from a 250 pound box into the performance of you know a much more sophisticated live switching kind of deal with a big complicated interface but control yeah so that's the, that's the core of our of our studio is this little box uh, which came out earlier this year uh, Brilliant. So, and Linda, just to say what I'm doing is I'm just hitting hotkeys on my um, machine to switch between scenes. And I have to say, I found that the hardest thing because I'm sometimes looking in the wrong camera or I've got the wrong shots up. And I have to say that's something that I need to work on because it, 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 it was it was tricky for me for someone who'd not done that before. Yeah. What I'd say about both of you, though, knowing you, is that you are both very comfortable in, in front of a camera. And, and one of the points that was raised here in, in the discussion is that, of course, not all academics or lecturers have that level of confidence in front of the camera uh, allied with the level of confidence to be able to find the right hot button at the right time to swap and so on. So I guess the question, you know, the question is one of the things of, how, you know, how can we gain confidence in, in these in these approaches? Well, we I mean, don't always find the right button, do we, Mark? Uh, <laughs> we all make mistakes. And so I think it's just a case of uh, not worrying too much. Uh, really, the students won't mind if you if you hit the wrong button and go, sorry, I just hit the wrong button and then you hit the right one. They really won't care. Uh, and it's Linda, bit, oh, sorry. Sorry. Mark. Yeah, go for it, Mark. Yeah, sorry. I mean, so, so, so yes, I might come across as confident, but, you know, I was nervous about doing this. You know, um, uh, I had I practiced a lot with Matthew. I mean, a lot, a lot. 
So, you know, just working with him and maybe um, a, a couple of colleagues at Goldsmiths, just trying it out. What works? What doesn't? Mm -hmm. How do I switch between it? So you might, I might come across as being confident now, but it took an awful lot of work for me to get familiar enough with the technology that I felt I could deliver a good performance. Yeah. So I would, I mean, the reason that technology is kind of interesting is it's a chance to give us feedback. So what I would suggest is try it out for yourself. Try it just with a friend or, or, or with a colleague or someone that you live with and just see how they're interacting with you. But if you ignore the technology, you're not going to get better. So, yes, it might be an incremental development in your confidence, but that comes with hours and hours and hours of, of working at yeah. trying to make this work as well as possible. It doesn't come for free, you know. Brilliant. OK, well, thank you very much both. I'm going to I'm going to ask Simon to to talk to us now. Um, there are more conversations coming in through the chat, so let's let's interact with them there if we can, and also pick up some of these at the end. Um, so Simon, if I can pass over to you. Simon, I'm afraid you're on mute. Yes, just trying to unmute the most familiar phrase of 2020. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I would uh, like to uh, begin by paying uh, homage, I think, to uh, Mark and Matthew. Um, I've learned a good deal and I'm afraid that in nearly everything I say, um, I will be contravening um, what um, Mark and uh, Matthew have said, not least in terms of my practice. I have no um, opportunity to uh, share in uh, the uh, background or what have you. The sound will be the standard sound of my laptop. The camera will be the standard one dimensional camera that I'm looking into now. But what I wanted to uh, begin with is I think something that perhaps Mark uh, might well appreciate. Um, it's the words of a musician, uh, a musician um, who spent a good deal of time uh, in the 1970s and ever since. Uh, contemplating the various qualities of musicianship and technology. And that is uh, Florian Schneider from uh, Craftwork, um, who has accompanied me um, to a point during uh, various phases of lockdown, um, not least uh, his computer world composition. Um, but the point I want to make here is that sometimes, oh, you know, to quote, sometimes we play the music, sometimes the music plays us, and sometimes it plays. And I think with uh, the technology that we are facing with, faced with, and the opportunities that abound, us, then sometimes you know we have the opportunity to uh, engage in learning. Sometimes the learning happens to us, and sometimes it's just learning. And I think this um, provocation, if you like, this reflection allows us to engage in a form of discussion, which I'm very much looking forward to over the course of the next sort of five, ten minutes on my behalf and then the discussion afterwards to think about the way we use synchronous uh, learning opportunities and indeed asynchronous learning. And I'll, I have a, a brief confession to, to make in this too. That is that um, I am as a scholar much more familiar with and indeed have uh, invested in in the last few years the practice of asynchronous learning. That is the opportunity to think about learning that takes place without uh, the direct intervention uh, uh, at the same time as uh, the teacher. And I think what that has enabled me to do is to provide a certain um, perspective and indeed much uh, quality learning that goes on in the programmes I'm responsible for and engage with. But it also in terms of where we are with uh, you know, responding to COVID and in the institution and in the industry that we work with, to think about the opportunities for synchronous learning too. And why is it that synchronous learning is such a uh, feature that seems to be um, held up uh, to scrutiny? Why is it that it's something that people uh, are ascribing to? What is it about the performance that Mark so expertly um, shared that enabled us to um, be able to uh, engage and learn a little bit more about um, mathematics than uh, I have done for the last 25 years. And I think this is the, the importance here, therefore, is the relationship between the synchronous and the asynchronous. Thinking about what learning goes on 
outside of the classroom as we used to conceive of it that was four walls in a uh, an institution called a university and the synchronous learning that takes place often in the past in those four walls but we would already and again i would point this to the, in the performative arts in certain science um, subjects the lab work the um, performance the exhibition space were already synchronous learning uh, opportunities that were taking place without necessarily the centrality of the teacher and this you know idea speaks to much of the literature on you know flipped classrooms and what have you but again you know it, it's not novel for this audience i'm sure but what it does speak to is the importance of the value of an online learning community in our current times the learning community part of that is really what i would want to talk about for the next uh, you know two or three minutes and that's really where we have an opportunity to put a um, key discussion as part of what we're um, sharing um, whether that's part of the um, subject matter whether that's part of you know what's going on with uh, the us presidential presidential election whether that's the quality of the sound that's coming through in each of these regards what we're able to see is a clear uh, resonance for community learning and that's one of those things that we took for granted when we were all in that same you know four walls uh, in a classroom but this is where i think the opportunity to really develop a blend uh, for want of a word and there are plenty about going around hybrid high flex uh, etc but where we take essentially the best parts of our synchronous learning experience the performative elements that um, we can prepare for and engage with and then also the um, substantive parts which allow for learning which aren't um, synchronous and there i think we have a, a real uh, opportunity so when we have lectures that are over um, 20 minutes long or even over six minutes long is the um, my preferred length but when you have that kind of length of material that often colleagues want to be able to share that is something that we need to be able to see more of and in that sense whenever we talk about uh, the opportunity for interaction we see that in the margins of lectures we see that in the corridors we see that in the conversations that um, students might pull you uh, back to we could use the um, opportunity to uh, speak to um, the different um, interactions that students can have and in the technology that we're afforded we can see that there are uh, numerous ways of having um, breakout groups etc etc this is what um, we're going to be able to um, deal with we you know there are different technologies teams can do it zoom can do it whichever one you know whichever platform we are we're able to utilize in those those discursive moments and in a subject which uh, I teach uh, most of the time which is uh, the subject of diplomacy these discussions are really the opportunity for that reflective practice which Mark spoke about so in some sense it's not so much around you know a particular piece of code or a particular um, fact as much as it is about an opinion in which you know, there may be right and wrong answers so I think whether you're looking at a demonstration of watch this video clip listen to this uh, sound file and then allow students those interactive moments those synchronous learning uh, challenges can still be there i think they can you know they're obviously determined by factors of time um, in terms of availability but providing a through a 24-hour period and i think this is where um, you know, one of the logistical challenges of, of higher education moving away from the the fixed timetable that things happen between you know nine and ten because it's tuesday morning and that's when the lecture must take place but providing a window of opportunity for those sort of synchronous and indeed asynchronous activities maybe half a dozen students can meet at nine o'clock maybe another three or four can meet at half past ten and another three or four at two o'clock in the afternoon by the time you get to nine o'clock the following morning the synchronous activity has worked seamlessly one hopes with the asynchronous activity of those different sort of subgroups and you're providing focused activities with those real time interactions allows students the opportunity to have the sense of learning community, even if dispersed by time and space. In some of the challenges that we face in terms of uh, synchronous learning, we often uh, think about sort of you know, group presentations or the opportunity to work in small groups. It's one of the you know, sort of familiar traits of any tra teacher training, um, uh, particularly of, of yesteryear. 
but they clearly have merits. And being able to put yourself in a safe space, not just in a sort of breakout room that as a uh, tutor you might arbitrarily decide, but to provide those spaces for students to work on an ongoing basis. And indeed, this is where I would say there's an opportunity for increased um, inclusion and di diversity uh, or addressing inclusion and diversity because those can be self-governed. And here I think one of the important words that Mark mentioned was around trust and being able to talk about the trust levels between uh, students and uh, their classmates and the materials that are being presented. And through that, that's the how of their being presented. And this is where the opportunities again exist for us to think about the um, synchronous and the asynchronous hand in glove. So when you're talking about perhaps a quiz or uh, assignment, you know, little task that you've set with regard to student uh, for a student to undertake, this is where they can see how they are able to uh, engage with each other and indeed get feedback. Now that feedback can be from each other. It can be from other groups. It can be over a period of time. But I think the opportunity to reflect is really where we're building that. And that's something that's lost often in synchronous learning. And one of the affordances of our times is that we can build in a little bit more reflection into those synchronous activities by utilising breakout rooms, feedback, chat facilities as we can see them. One of the other um, dimensions that I wanted to think about here was really about the sort of provocations for what's next in uh, synchronous learning. If we're in a scenario about, you know, really comes down to questions of what the university is, what the university offers into society, you know, I'm hopeful, as, as I'm sure many of you are, that universities, you know, perhaps by default, will be the uh, vessels which, you know, responses to the COVID crisis uh, come from, um, from colleagues in you know, relevant sciences, but also from colleagues who are undertaking important research into the um, <coughs> social impact of this current uh, climate. And I think that's where being partners with our students as members of society, their opportunity to engage in what they might seem real time activities is something that we can really uh, speak to and, and take advantage of. As a final point, um, I can come back to perhaps uh, something that um, Mark mentioned in terms of the quality of sound and vision and you know, backdrop and what have you, and recognise that in one's own practice, there are you know, um, opportunities there to, to learn and move forward. And in some senses, you know, perhaps my greatest action point from this will be to uh, invest in some of that um, technology uh, facilities um, that I need to to enhance, you know, perhaps the, the power of um, my words such as they are. Uh, I'll draw it to a close there. Thank you very much. Um, look forward to your questions. Thanks, thanks Simon. Um, I think um, Andrew's just raised the screen just to show people where, where, the, where to pop the, P, the q and A. in. If you could just show that slide, Andrew, that would be great. Um, thank you very much. Um, First of all, there was, a, there was a lovely comment about how nice it was to see your background with your bike, etc. Um, and I think the, the point that the, the person who submitted that was um, not, not particularly your bike and choice of, uh, of things on your shelves, but the fact that you become a human to the students um, and that the students can also feel more confident in sharing, sharing their screen. And I know that that is certainly a challenge for, for many of us who are teaching online is just that getting the students to turn the camera on and whether we need to get them to turn the camera on and what, what that means. So I, I liked um, Simon that you were able to <clears throat> think about this idea of using synchronous and asynchronous to ensure <clears throat> that students have an opportunity to reflect and therefore engage with with the learning or the opportunities for community and peer learning that you, you presented. So we've got some questions coming in. I'm just going to have a quick look at those if I may. Um, so we've got a question that says, are there any synchronous online platforms that allow students to quickly get into pairs or small, small groups they choose <clears throat> and then feedback to others, everyone, just as easily, as quickly as they can in a bricks and mortar uh, room? I think that's a good question because I think Zoom and Teams <clears throat> give us the control, whoever's doing the event, the control of the, the groups. Is that right? Do you want to comment on that, Simon? Yeah, I mean, one of the, the, the challenges, I think, is the the particular affordances of much of this technology. And of course, we're all learning and there are upgrades coming all the time. But through 
even the evolution of teams that we've seen over the course of the last six months, you know, the the, the centrality of, um, you know, the 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 owner of the process, you know, that that, you know, the, in democratizing the classroom and democratizing the learning space, you know, as a to, to really say it as it is, we need to have a greater sort of um, ability and, and really share ownership across the different platforms that, you know, that some of that is, you know, practical sort of bandwidth kind of issues. Some of that is you new know, um, delivering material. You know, in some senses, this is what this is. This is a presentation today. If this were our class, I would like to be in the conversation, not delivering it. Um, and it's something you know that that's partly because I would have the opportunity to learn, which I recognise in myself, and partly because I think it also makes you more accessible. And I think that the you know one of the reasons why I've I've neglected to utilise my institutional backdrop is that it makes it doesn't allow for the the connection with my students with me. And it's not that I am you know the be all and end all of their learning, but more you know over and again it's that connection that facilitates the learning and i think that's where the synchronicity uh, allows us to really make some you know make our presence felt and i think that does with that that reinforces mark point about you know it's our presence you know my presence might be conveyed by you know the bike over my left shoulder or the you know my father's day card that's on the shelf for my son but you know that that's that's who i am and i, I would want that to be part of my my performance my ability and you know experience and skills to share my learning with others and you know by all accounts you know it's something that has worked and continues to work because my presence in their learning is something that has enabled students to learn not because you know others couldn't do it or because others can do it you know in a different way or better so to speak but because it enables the students that you know you have a relationship with and I think you know words like relationship trust you know these are things that you know um, immediately one might think that the distance of a camera and a computer you know put, are barriers but I think they can be um, overcome and indeed encouraged I, I've often said you know for a decade having worked with both campus students and online distance students simultaneously that I know my online students better you know I feel as though I know them I think they know me mm, uh, to mm. a greater extent because of the the nature of the interaction and that's different from seeing someone you know once a week for an hour every 10 weeks and thinking that you you know them so that's where I think the they're not mutually exclusive but the opportunities are there I think you're absolutely right Simon thank you for that 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 point there uh, is, is very powerful actually that you can know your online students more effectively I'm going to invite Thierry to, to to present now because he's got some good stuff to talk about as well um, there's some fantastic discussion going on in the in the question and answer area and actually what's really nice is that people are sharing lots of resources and suggestions we'll make sure we capture as much of that discussion um, in the recording of the event as well as we can when we share that Thierry welcome and uh, please please go ahead yeah hello um, so first of all thank you for the University of London to invite me uh, to speak in, uh, in such a brilliant uh, panel um, I um, uh, am um, a member of CNAM which stands for National Conservatory of Arts and Craftsmanship and just a few words about this institution, which is a higher public, um, a higher education public institution, uh, just to let you know the background of our learners. Um, CNAM was founded uh, in uh, during the French Revolution. And um, uh, as you can see, I am wearing proudly the badge uh, of the founder, who is uh, Abbot Grégoire. And I've got another badge, which stands for Yes, We CNAM. But it's, it's another story uh, at the present. And uh, um, so the, the idea of CNAM is to raise people through education, social uh, raising. And uh, uh, we don't have students, we have learners. So it's really vocational studies and lifelong learning. So th this is for the background and to explain you um, uh, what we are, uh, what is taught at, uh, at uh, CNAM. Um, so um, uh, I'm going to speak about virtual reality 
and uh, uh, especially what you can do to learn and to teach and learn uh, using uh, um, virtual reality. Um, you have to uh, realize that uh, the VR uh, headsets are stepping into our homes uh, in, in, a, in a couple of years, uh, just because uh, um, this kind of headsets are getting more and less and less expensive and uh, that there are a lot of use with these headsets for uh, virtual reality. So uh, in, 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 um, uh, you, you can buy uh, around 300 and 500 euros uh, headset uh, that can perform um, uh, virtual reality. And uh, the, what can you do with it is uh, entertainment, of course. You can use it for gaming, uh, for uh, 3D and virtual uh, games. Uh, but you can also use it for culture, uh, especially for virtual visit. And in these times of pandemia, this is something which is really important uh, to be able to uh, visit uh, in an immersive way uh, some museum, for example. And, and uh, uh, there is a, at CNAM, we have a fantastic museum uh, of technological object. And I would love you to uh, uh, welcome in this museum as soon as possible. And the third uh, uh, way to use this uh, headset is, of course, education and uh, um, teaching and learning in, in a virtual space. And this will be uh, the core uh, subject of, of my talk. Um, so um, what I can say is uh, uh, last Tuesday evening, I, I was at my desk in Paris and I was attending a meeting on a beautiful and sunny beach. Um, and I'm going to show you, I hope, uh, I don't have the fantastic uh, um, tools than uh, uh, Mark and Matthew, uh, but I will share my screen and show you some stuff. Um, here it is. Uh, and about this beautiful and sunny beach is that, I hope you see my screen uh, perfectly. Um, you should have a, a white uh, stuff. It's uh, a blank white screen at the moment. Good, thank you, Linda. Um, so this is some picture taking, taken from the scene uh, on, the, on this sunny beach. And you see we were gathering uh, uh, something like 20 people all together as avatars. And uh, I was looking uh, and we were speaking all together. We had some uh, interesting talk about uh, uh, VR, this was organized by an organization called F France Immersive Learning, and I will talk a little bit more at the end. And uh, uh, can you imagine that in this uh, world you can even take selfies? Uh, so uh, this is a selfie uh, with the people that was there around me. But uh, so this is uh, something which could look um, funny, but again, uh, if you want to teach, if you want to uh, engage people, you have to provide them with uh, quite interesting tools uh, to do that. Uh, and we also had some, uh, so that was in June. Uh, it was, an, uh, as you can see on the, on the screen on the, on the right, an expert talk uh, on the, the VR, uh, organized by this France Immersive Learning. And we were in this space all together uh, with, uh, uh, with, with, with the screen uh, and slides going on. There was a panel uh, of, uh, sitting uh, down uh, uh, under, the sc under the screen and you had this theater around. But um, uh, it, it was very interesting. We had the ve very uh, good um, uh, presenters and uh, we could talk all together. And uh, um, that, that, was, that was a nice uh, uh, opportunity, but um, it's still, we, we are in a virtual space uh, and we still have the metaphor of having a screen and banks and people sitting and hearing. But um, uh, I will show you um, a, a virtual space. So we, we, we did this uh, meeting in, in a space called Engage. Uh, it's Engage VR, you can find. And I will show you uh, in, a, in a few seconds a video of what this uh, what this um, uh, virtual space can provide to you. 
So just playing with different screen and so on. And here it is. So um, it is really dedicated for teaching. So you can put any 3D objects in a virtual space and show them and you can teach on Mars, as you can briefly see. Uh, you can have a, a, a meeting room, but you can also do very uh, strange stuff with cannons, but you can have a, a remote uh, collaboration with this kind of uh, uh, note stick and you can also have whiteboard and, and, and write on the board, but you can be also in, in very uh, um, difficult situation as this one, uh, although you are not, you are still in safe uh, during, and you can perform uh, gesture, and that will be also the, the point of my talk. Uh, training uh, in, in uh, for example, uh, you can train people uh, about phobia if they don't like to take the plane, uh, and you can help them with the headset, uh, and you can have this, uh, I just make a pause on this, uh, uh, th this was a brilliant uh, talk on, on chemistry uh, and I don't know if you can see that, but they are in the Oxford Library, I think, I was told, um, and then so on. Um, so this, these are some examples of the spaces and on the situation that you can perform using Engage. Um, and we are... Um, uh, we are on the verge to use them uh, more and more. Uh, so just a few glimpses about the, the different headsets. It, it's just to let you know that the hardware is uh, is uh, uh, exploding as uh, you have more and more different hardware uh, to, to use for headsets, uh, like this hardware that are wired to a computer uh, and other one uh, that are uh, autonomous, uh, like uh, this one. Um, uh, so uh, Oculus Quest, as I so said, is uh, 500 euro uh, about to, to buy. And uh, you can have very sophisticated uh, apparatus like uh, devices like uh, this one, uh, which is a headset which is connected to a backpack with the computer on, on your back. Um, so that's gives you the ability to move, not only to, to be seated on your, on, on your uh, desk and look at stuff uh, with the headset, but you can even move uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in the space. So uh, at CNAM, we are experimenting at the present with um, a company called Nimbus, and uh, we are producing, uh, and it is the very beginning of the project, uh, we are producing this kind of stuff uh, for training uh, our, our uh, learners, which are not students again. Uh, they are workers, uh, they, they are, uh, the, 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 the courses are, are in the evening or on Saturday morning and they have a work, they have family. So we really have to uh, give them very high um, uh, very high quality resources for education. Uh, so. Um, this kind of uh, simulation uh, can be used by um, somebody who needs to be trained to technical gesture. So you can see, um, I make just a, a brief stop uh, to show you that what is he doing on his um, uh, ankle? Uh, uh, indeed, uh, he has a screen on his arm uh, and everything is written on the screen on the scenario he has to do. Uh, so this kind of stuff, you cannot have them in the real life, of course, and it helps a lot uh, to design uh, the, the pedagogical scenario. So in this case, um, you have to um, uh, be trained to use uh, this device that uh, uh, unbottled perfume. Um, and uh, as you can see, uh, it has been very uh, um, uh, um, uh, precisely uh, modelized. Um, and uh, th this is really something, we, we are not going to be able to produce something so sophisticated uh, for our courses, but the idea is to, to uh, produce uh, scenes uh, for our virtual um, um, practical uh, courses. And in this case, he's waiting the bottle. Um, and uh, uh, so that, that the idea is uh, uh, he, he has to be trained how to wait, but also he can do some, we can train maintaining so maintenance of the uh, of the device of the machine, and in this case, you see uh, you have to perform the, the the different gesture to do that. 
Um, so for, for the uh, learner's point of view, uh, in what you have seen here is a, is a, is a, uh, is a person alone performing uh, as an autonomous. But what we really want to do using this kind of tools is uh, train the people in the virtual space um, with a trainer next to you. So for so the Mimbus uh, company provides us with um, a platform that have tr analytics, uh, which are uh, analytics for uh, the technical gesture. And in this video, you will see that in this case, there is a teacher and even another uh, uh, learner uh, with him and uh, you have to connect to, to the simulation using the, the and then this is electrical abilities, uh, the courses and everything that the, the, uh, the learners do is uh, of course recorded and uh, as you can see on the screen, you have all um, the, the analytics of uh, what he has done on the gesture. So uh, it has really, um, as you can see, a training path that uh, he can try and try and try again. And I've done this simulation. I, I can tell you it's really difficult uh, to handle uh, an industrial electric um, um, uh, the, um, uh, board. Uh, because uh, I was elect electrified uh, many times before uh, uh, realizing what I had to do. And you can see the analytics. And when the learner come back at his office, uh, he can log on onto the platform and uh, review uh, what, uh, what he has done and, and his progress. Um, so um, I'm, I'm going to end my presentation uh, with uh, this uh, few. Uh, which is a, another way to perform um, uh, technical gesture in, in, the, uh, in the virtual space, uh, which, as you can see, there is a real guy, but he's in the virtual space. And because he's on, on, a, on a green, uh, in front of a green screen, so uh, this is something we, we, we call the uh, uh, augmented virtuality, because you have some, some guys and the, uh, the teacher can see the, the, the learner within uh, the scene instead of seeing what the learner see it. And this on the on the top right, you see the screen of what the learner see. And it's awful because generally you, you, you move your head very fast and, and uh, it's um, uh, it's difficult to uh, to work uh, to, to to realize what the learning learner is doing. Um, so the, this was uh, some um, some of the um, insight I wanted to share with you about uh, this, uh, and uh, I will be happy uh, to uh, uh, answer some questions about that. Uh, and I'm now f uh, exiting the sharing my screen mode. Thank you, thanks. Well, that was fantastic and, and uh, definitely moving us forward. I know that we're just about coming up to uh, to the end of the hour now, so colleagues will have to leave, but we, we're we happy to stay on for a little bit further discussion if uh, if people are available to. We've got some questions that have come in on the, the question panel. Um, uh, one of the things is that there's been some discussion in the question panel about particular headsets and so on, and um, what, what we'll try and do is get some responses to some of those specific questions. Um, Mark's also um, put up for us the the link to the evaluation survey and uh, as we, we would welcome <coughs> your, your responses if you can um, to that. Um, a couple of things, a couple of questions that came up that I thought were, were quite useful um, to frame some of the discussions here were um, there was a question about that Second Life has been doing this sort of um, uh, avatar activity for a long time. But the question was, why, why will it be different now? What are what are the features that are making it different now? Why is it more likely to, to work now? Um, the difference with, uh, uh, with Second Life uh, is, uh, um, uh, I've, I've used it a lot when it, it was, it, it's, it's still working, but um, when you are in front of, of a screen and it's, 2D uh, screen uh, with a 3D um, a scene and then you are moving your avatar and do some stuff it, with your mouse uh, or a, 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 a stick but 
uh, this is um, this is totally different when you are using a headset and your hand and you are uh, emerged in a scene uh, and you are look looking around and uh, you you can perform stuff and um, the the sound is spe is specialized that means uh, if I am have somebody of my right I I hear him uh, on my right ear so uh, it's it's really um, um, change the way you you have to tell your your um, brain that you are uh, in uh, not in a virtual space but you are in reality and the more you provide a uh, way to um, um, to do that uh, and the, the ultimate goal is memorization uh, it's really memory uh, i can tell you stuff that i have done using my headset uh, especially for the training on the electrical um, the skills electric electric skills uh, six months ago i still remember clearly fully what i have done uh, and uh, uh, sometimes some people say the, to me, oh, I was uh, near the cathedral of uh, Paris uh, and then said, oh, no, no, sorry, I was in the virtual space near the cathedral of Paris, uh, not, not in the real life. But the, 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 there was um, um, so, some mixture because, between uh, virtual space and reality in this case. Uh, so it's a question of memory. OK, so it's that kinesthetic experience, which watching a screen, you don't gain that same kinesthetic experience. Exactly. Um, and there was also a question, I think, um, around the effectiveness of learning through virtual reality, whether there's any research going on into the effectiveness of this type of learning with virtual or augmented reality in comparison to to the old days. Although these days, I'm not sure what the old days count as. Is this? <laughs> Is it this or is it back in the day when we were all in a room? Um, uh, so I think that that's an interesting question, which you might have some some comment on, Thierry. The thing is, uh, virtual reality is not new. Uh, it has been uh, developed and there have been research on uh, for more than 15 years. Uh, the thing is, what is really different is that for uh, a couple of years, the device are affordable. Uh, that, so that means we can really think uh, using them uh, not uh, in a uh, because uh, on, on there was the the, the big uh, corporate company uh, like uh, uh, produ the one producing the cars or, or planes uh, that had this kind of device and they can use it uh, on the training. Uh, now uh, it's really uh, uh, it's possible to buy uh, twenty of these headsets for a group. Uh, in, 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 a, in the course, um, and uh, uh, so, so, so th this is uh, this is uh, the, the, the game changing of um, uh, of the virtual reality uh, using for for uh, training uh, on the on the, on the next year. Um, so, so, so this is the the the, the, uh, the idea. Thank you very much. So, I think one of the themes we've had today is 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 the the, the affordability and accessibility of equipment. Um, we've seen that with Matthew and Mark and in, in your discussion here and also then with Simon sort of sandwiched in the middle with the, the, the sort of humanist student student centre perspective as well, which I think has been really exciting. We will draw to a close now. There are lots and lots of interesting sharing that's gone on in the Q&A section and we'll make sure we try and extract as much of that as possible, particularly links to resources and so on. Um, just to say that we've got our, um, in, in 2020, we've got our last of the experiences in digital learning series webinars taking place on the 1st of December, um, two till three GMT time and that will be reflections on digital learning in 2020 perspectives from the educator so it will be an opportunity for colleagues to to share their perspectives on on what's happened in this very remarkable year in terms of uh, learning and teaching within the digital space so I'm, I'm very very impressed with the sessions that we've had today uh, thank you to the audience for engaging so effectively Thank you to to uh, to the presenters and thank you to the, uh, the the teams in the background making this all work. Andrew and Mark in particular and Kim. Um, very nice to see everybody. Keep safe, keep well, and we look forward to seeing you for the next installation on the 1st of December.